Welcome to our new show. This is the Malcolm Roberts Show, same title, but we've got a new format. The aims of our show are to restore our country and our planet for those watching overseas. We're also conscious that Australia is part of planet Earth, but we want to do it for humans to flourish. Today we have, as that remarkable Scotsman Billy Connolly would say, another cracker show. Our guest is coming to us from Wyoming. And I checked the temperature last night in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and it was minus eight degrees centigrade. First of all, before getting onto the show proper with our guest, I want to thank everyone for your calls, your emails, and for stopping me in the street, the airport, to say that you like my TNT radio. But I want to thank you for this show, for having me as your guest in your car, your kitchen, the shed, men's shed, lounge, barbecue, or wherever you are right now. Sitting, standing, driving, walking, running, laying down, exercising, who knows what you're doing. So I want to remind you that we've got uh, our show's two most important themes continue. First one is freedom, specifically freedom replacing control, which is breaking out around the world. We want freedom to come back and, re and replace control. And our guest today is very, very important for that. The second theme is responsibility, specifically personal responsibility and integrity. History repeatedly shows that both are essential for human progress and for people's livelihoods. Let's have a look at some current events, some ridiculous events, some humorous events that have happened uh, in the last few days. First of all, a very serious one, a very deeply troubling one, the United Nations World Health Organization pandemic treaty, which wants to control from the World Health Organization each country's health response to a fabricated future virus or pandemic. We're not putting up with that. We've already started uh, started work on that. We started, in fact, early last year and broadcast that to people and got that out in the open. That's a really serious one. Then we've got another one here from um, about the temperatures in Sydney. This is from Ben Domencino, who's an independent, works with an independent weather bureau he says 2022, this was only earlier this week, he says 2022 will be Sydney's first year on record to remain below 32 degrees centigrade at the city's official observatory, Observatory Hill weather station. This is an astonishing feat. These are his words. With data for this site available back to 1859. So what's that? 41, 23, uh, 163 years. A remarkable. Sydney, highest temperature in 2022 was 31.9 degrees centigrade. First year to stay below 32 degrees centigrade. That's going to be very interesting for our guests today. And then we've got an issue that's, uh, that's just happened yesterday and our whole office celebrated, and as did much of Australia and a hell of a lot of New Zealanders. The Kiwis were, were really cheering. This is a serious item. It's also a ridiculous item. It's also a humorous item, and it's a joyous item. Yesterday, Jacinda Ardern announced her resignation. She won't be standing for a re-election. And the cheers in New Zealand were dramatic. It was just so funny to see uh, see the, the, the Twitter crowd um, broadcasting, the, the cheers in, in the, among the Kiwis. And then something that's serious, but so it's also a bit funny. Anthony Albanese, our Prime Minister in Australia, had a train wreck interview on The Voice. Uh, it looks like Peter Dutton is letting Labor hang itself. That's why he's been quiet. Seems like a pretty good strategy with, with the Labor Party in charge, just let them do their own damage. But The Voice is a very serious issue, and um, I'm totally opposed to it because I want one nation. It is a united nation that we have in this country, not a racist nation separated based on race and divided based on race. And Anthony Albanese brought back memories of Clark and Dor <laughs> show on ABC TV. What a train wreck. Right. Let's welcome and introduce my guest. This man is known by many people around the world. He's known because he's got a dry sense of humor. He introduces things based on facts, some really significant and important things based on facts. And Entirely factual. Now, we're going to talk about the corruption of data and specifically climate science data. But I think with knowing Tony, 
he, he tweets and works on and and, uh, and has video podcasts on many many topics. So we'll get onto lots of issues today. This man is a remarkable person. He is first of all a true climate scientist. Climate scientists are broken into two large groups: geologists who can tell us about the past. Uh, warming and past cooling and past cycles and past climate and a atmospheric physicists who can tell us about what's happening uh, today and the theory and also meteorologists. So we've got people who are dealing with the atmosphere and we've got people who are dealing with the earth. Tony comes from the second people dealing with the earth. But he's not just a scientist. He's also an electrical engineer, which in my view, having been, been through university, is the is the toughest engineering course to do. Electrical engineering, you have to be very bright to do it. And, uh, and But in addition, Tony is very personable, caring, dedicated, hugely competent. He's been the star of our inquiries uh, and, he's, and he's a volunteer. So uh, welcome, Tony Heller. Yeah, thank you, Senator. It's good to be here. Yeah, it's lovely to have you. Um, we, we first met in person when was that 2017 early 2017 it was um it was actually election week 2016 in the united states oh, that's, i was that's i was right. there when donald trump was elected <laughs> and the australian <laughs> press was despondent <laughs> yeah and when we were delighted pauline and i opened a bottle of champagne on on the, on the steps of parliament house and and you were very happy too yeah I think um, they took they took a video of us uh, toasting Donald Trump out in front of Parliament House, which was shown on uh, Australian television over and over again. So it was, yeah, it was pretty uh, funny. Yeah, that was probably the only glimpse that they got of you on Australian television here because you're a bit outspoken and they can't handle you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, just for for viewers, Tony. I arranged for and sponsored Tim Ball, Professor Tim Ball, who, in my opinion, is the best climate scientist in the world. Well, he's, he, he was because he died just recently, a few months ago. But t uh, Tim was phenomenal, a true Renaissance man, could talk about any topic knowledgeably, very, very strong. Um, and, and I also invited Tony to come down, and Tony sponsored his own way down. He paid for himself. Uh, and we had the uh, presentation of Tim and Tony, and there's some funny memories i remember that some startling memories too we had a good crowd uh, not many mps they seem to be scared of you tony but um they're scared of the facts but but we had the first presentation first facebook live stream from parliament house i think and it was tim ball and tony heller yeah that was uh that was pretty fun i remember one particular um incident where one of the reporters started attacking you you, you had made some comments about banks central banks i believe and um, so he, he started, yeah, he started implying that what you were saying was anti-Semitic because you were talking about banks and he started going into this rant about as you being anti-Semitic. So I, I tapped Malcolm on the back, Senator on Roberts on the back and was doing, he let me step in front of the microphone. I said, well, I find what you're saying to be incredibly offensive of being a Jew myself. And, 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 you're, and um, I remember the reporter, I'm not, I'm not sure who it was, might have been Peter Hannum, sort of backed off and was crawled away with his tail between his legs. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, uh, that was hilarious because you just jumped right out. So before yeah. we start the, the, um, the, the formal presentation, because I've asked you to bring some, some of your slides, and there's one in particular I'm itching to show everyone. We always start our show with something you appreciate. So anything at all, Tony? Could be family, could be weather, could be uh, could be anything at all. What do you appreciate? Um, really appreciate dogs quite a bit. Now we have nine of them in the house right now. Uh, we just had a litter of four new puppies, uh, which we're trying to find um, good homes for. But I'm I'm very much a dog lover, and I love to hike and cycle and. That's the reason I live in Wyoming. Um, I can go out hiking here all day long and not see anybody. I lived in Colorado for a long time, and Colorado has gotten very overcrowded and very politically disturbing. Um, so <laughs> so when the governor of Colorado announced he was going to lock the state down in March of 2020, 
He said, no, nope, not doing this. Grabbed the dogs, got in the car, and <laughs> drove to Nebraska. I filmed Sandhill Cranes for a few weeks. Then I came back. On my way back, I stopped in Wyoming and um, found a place to live in, in Wyoming, which is the least populous state, and I'm very happy about that. It's also the most Republican state, which is nice. Yeah, uh, I, I can I, I uh, lived and worked in the United States. I studied in the United States. I've been there more than five years. Um, and I've traveled through all 50 of your states, and I, I fell in love with the country. I detest your government. I absolutely detest your government. It's, it's a cruel, inhuman government. It has been for a few decades now, with the exception of the, the light that Donald Trump shone. But I've been in every one of your states, and it's a fabulous, um, fabulous people. I love America. Well, I'm married an American, and both our kids are American, they're dual citizens. And um, I remember the, the sad decline uh, of the United States. It really has, has fallen quite a bit, as has most of the Western countries. Um, but I, I remember California was on a very tragic downhill slope and decline. And back when Colorado was actually still somewhat of a decent <laughs> place to live, uh, I remember the Californian... Um, the, the Coloradans talking about the Californicators coming in and destroying their, their state. And now you've had to leave Colorado and move to Wyoming and, and other people in Texas are now thinking about the, the Californicators coming in with their socialism and destroying Texas. So it, it really is a disease that's spreading, isn't it? Yeah. Um, California immigrants destroyed Colorado. They're, they're destroying Arizona, uh, but Wyoming, uh, we're fortunate here that it's very cold and we have a lot of winds and people from California can't really stand to live here. So, <laughs> so it's, it's sort of our self-defense. <laughs> well, Wyoming's got uh, lots of plain lands and some mountains. And it's also, so you, you've got a lot of wind and a lot of cold. So you, wind chill factor really drives the temperature down in, in uh, your state, doesn't it now? Yeah, in, in the part of Wyoming I'm in, Cheyenne, it's extremely windy. We're in southeast Wyoming, and they're, we're pretty far away from the mountains. Um, Western Wyoming actually has very spectacular mountains, the Tetons, mm. Yellowstone, yeah. and, um, Wind River Mountains. But over here in the southeast corner, we, we're not really protected from the wind by the mountains like they are across the border in Colorado. So. Um, there's a huge difference. The climate here is much more severe than it is just 30 miles to the south in Colorado, which is great. I, I, your, your temperatures would be somewhat similar to Minnesota and Chicago in, in the middle of winter, wouldn't they? Um, yeah, it's probably temperatures, are, but the climate's not, you know, that those places tend to be, well, at least Chicago tends to be very cloudy and overcast. We get a lot of sunshine here at yeah. least. Um, but the, the main problem is just the wind. It just sometimes the yeah. wind just blows for days on end. So. Well, I, I've been in the Tetons and, and hiked there and, and also Yellowstone and, and uh, driven through Cheyenne. We also we also talked about, oh, we also drove up to Alaska and Fairbanks. You're actually colder in Cheyenne on many days than, than Alaska. But let's get on to climate. Okay. Um, you're famous worldwide for exposing NASA's Goddard Institute of Space Studies corruption of temperature data. It's very important for people to understand that NASA is a massive organization, but the Goddard Institute of Space Studies is one of its departments, just one of its departments. And there's a tiny group of people within the Goddard Institute of Space Studies that are, is, are responsible for corrupting the temperature data. So it's not NASA we've got any problem with. It's NASA's Goddard Institute of Space Studies led by initially James Hansen and now by uh, Gavin Schmidt. And their entities have been corrupting the temperature data. Tell us about what you've done because you're famous for, for going right into that. Well, I, I like to um, look at historical data. I, I look at a lot of things from newspaper articles. And I like to look at, you know, find all the old temperature graphs I can find from government agencies like NASA and NOAA then compare them with their current graphs to see how they've altered them over time. And it's usually pretty dramatic what they've done. Um, if we go to the first slide, I can show you an example of this. So this, this was the NASA US temperature graph in 1999. It showed that 1934 was the warmest year in the United States. 1921 was the second warmest. In 1998 was more than half a degree Celsius cooler than 1934. 
and and James Hansen um, at NASA, who started the global warming scare before Congress in 1988 was very upset about the fact that the United States had been cooling since the 1930s. And he, he actually wrote a paper about this, that he was upset about it. So um, rather than trying to figure out what was wrong with their theory, um, they did what you might expect from a government agency and they just altered the data. So let's compare this cooling in the 1999 version with the current version, we're now, <laughs> now, what they did is they cooled 1934 quite a bit, they cooled 1921 quite a bit, and made 1998 the warmest year of the 20th century. So um, let's see if I can go back. So this was this is the act this is the actual thermometer data right here. And um, if you, I've plotted the thermometer data many times, and this is very close to the actual thermometer data. Um, which which didn't suit their agenda so they just altered the data to create the appearance of warming and the, uh, i see this pattern over and over again it's been done in australia as well mm -hmm. uh, australia has done an additional thing the bureau, bureau of meteorology they've not only altered the data but they've also hidden all the data before 1910. <laughs> there was a lot of extremely hot weather weather prior to 1910 in australia and if you go back to the 1995 yearbook of Australia, they showed that the hottest temperature ever recorded in Victoria and New South Wales and Queensland and Western Australia were all um, prior to 1910. But then by erasing all the temperatures before 1910, they also erased all of those temperature records. I think um, June 16th, 1889, I mean, January 16th, 1889, was the hottest temperature on record. It was in at Clon Curry, Clon Curry, yeah. Queensland. It was 32 point or 42 point eight Celsius or something like that. And that's been erased. Um, so yeah, that's a, this is uh, this is one of the things which I've enjoyed doing is exposing how they've altered the data to meet their agenda. And and what what um what brought you into this? Because, well, first of all, that's a fabulous graph. I've, I've seen it many times. I show it to people. Uh, it's quite clear that NASA's got it into space studies under James Hansen and then under Gavin Schmidt have distorted the temperature and artificially created global warming. <laughs> Although I guess, Tony, you could say that global warming is in fact real and man-made because it's all been done on a computer. Yeah, it's definitely man. This data tampering is definitely man-made. Um, as, as far as the climate itself goes, um, I don't think so. I don't think humans have too much effect on it. No, no. If you go back to your previous temperature, it's actually cooling. Your previous graph, the previous yeah, version. Of yeah, this, these are United States temperatures. Uh, um, let me see if I... They, they, oh, this graph, okay, so the, 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 I think these graphs are interesting. Mm. So this, these are the adjustments which are being made to the U.S. temperature data. You can see that temperatures from um, 1940 are cooled about more than one degree Fahrenheit, and current temperatures are warmed around one degree Fahrenheit. Okay, so notice the shape of this curve. Now let's look at the shape of the carbon dioxide curve. Notice that it's almost exactly the same. And here I'm going to plot the two of them together. So you can see what they've done. The green line is the adjustments. These are the alterations they've made to the temperature data, and the blue line is carbon dioxide. So what they're doing is they're altering the data to match the increase in carbon dioxide. <laughs> so what they're, it, it's it's pretty hilarious. They're, they're they've uh, done the exact opposite of how science is supposed to be done. You're supposed to craft your theory around the data, but what they did was they crafted the data around their <laughs> CO2 theory. Yeah. So, so, some of the worst science that's ever been done. Yeah, this, this is remarkable. Uh, can I have a copy of your slides, please? I want to show them to a few people in Australia uh, sure. when, when we finish the show. Yeah, um, yeah. But I've never seen that adjustments data uh, plotted on the same graph as the carbon dioxide data. Um, and there's something else about carbon dioxide we can come back to later because carbon dioxide, that measurement probably comes from Mauna, uh, Mauna Loa, right? Um, yeah, the, it was coming from Mauna Loa, but, you know, since they've had that eruption on Mauna Loa, um, back, I think in December they've actually moved the measurements to Mauna Kea, 
Um, okay. the, other, the other volcano on Hawaii. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Mauna Kea. I've I've climbed Mauna Loa, but Mauna Kea is the one opposite, and that's where the observatory's been for a long time. I'm sorry no, about them. No, actually, the the CO the carbon dioxide observatory is normally on Mauna Loa. Is it? But, yeah, but they moved it to Mauna Kea, where they have the astronomical observatory because of the eruption. Okay, uh, yeah. so the, the, so that's very interesting that they uh, measured CO two. Um, on a volcano that produces a lot of CO two, but yeah, I, I don't think that that's actually a huge issue because you get fairly similar measurements from other parts of the world too. But but they did have to move it recently because with the volcano actually erupting um, and the observatory being below the eruption and carbon dioxide being heavier than air, the CO two is actually sinking down towards the observatory. So. So um, you you said you've assembled a few slides. So firstly, thank you for that. Do you want to go through them? Because that that's the, that's the guts of what I'd like to cover today. So I'll leave it leave it in your hands. Other than in, uh, other than than stating that we know we have got very good temperature records from from back as early as 1859, as this man said. Uh, but we've got an extensive around about 17 screens, uh, 17 Stevenson screens, I think where they were measuring temperature in the 18, 1880s and 1890s, Tony, you'd be aware of that. And they were good measurements because they were done to the right standard. And they show that Australia's temperatures in the 1880s and 1890s were far warmer than today, far warmer than today. And, and uh, then it cooled down to 1910. And then from 1910, saw a slight warming. And then, then years of cooling, then a slight warming. Um, and so... What we've seen is, as you pointed out, the Bureau of Meteorology makes it impossible for people to get the data before 1910. And, and so what it looks like is there's been only warming. But if you look at 1880s, we've actually cooled. So anyway, over to you. Why you go with your with your show? OK. Um, yeah. So th this is one of my favorite slides here. We, we get all this speculation from the press and politicians and climate modelers that if we keep increasing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we're going to have this huge catastrophe and life's going to fall apart. That's the whole basis of the extinction rebellion. The people who like glue themselves to the pavement and block the roads in Melbourne. Um, but we, we actually, as geologists, I know that we actually have hundreds of millions of years of earth history, during which almost during almost all of that time, carbon dioxide levels were much higher than they are now. And, and when carbon dioxide was at its peak 540 million years ago in the Cambrian, that was the greatest expansion of life on Earth. Yeah. There was 15 times as much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere at that time than there is now. And that's when corals appeared in the ocean. It's when shellfish appeared in the ocean. So the arguments of that higher levels of carbon dioxide are bad for life are not supported by the historical record. We see the exact opposite. We know that life thrived at much higher carbon dioxide levels. We also know that the arguments about ocean acidification are not valid. Um, the carbon dioxide levels were 15 times higher than they are now, and, there were, and the oceans were full of coral and shellfish, so clearly they didn't dissolve. So the, the whole art, you know, this whole theoretical basis of the hysteria that increasing levels of carbon dioxide are going to cause life to collapse or some catastrophe are not supported by 600 million years of Earth's history, which have been well known and well studied for you know over a century. So that that's a good one. So another one, another point is that we have all these coal beds and, and those coal beds formed several hundred million years ago at a time when carbon dioxide levels were much higher. Um, life was very verdant. There was tremendous forests and these, they grew very quickly. And when these trees died, they fell down, fell into swamps, formed peat beds, which got buried and then turned into coal. So when we burn the coal now, what we're doing is we're returning the carbon dioxide to the atmosphere which left um, to hundreds of millions of years ago, and if we returned all of it back to the carbon dioxide, back to the levels that was um, hundred, you know, during the Carboniferous era, then we would expect to have very verdant vegetation again. But again, we hear all this nonsense. If we keep increasing CO two, everything's going to turn into a desert, and life's going to die, and it'll be uninhabitable. 
But once again, the historical record shows the exact opposite. There, there's no scientific basis to what they're saying. Um, and we know from NASA has shown um, that over the last few decades, as carbon dioxide has increased in the atmosphere, Earth has gotten much greener. It's, and NASA called it carbon dioxide fertilization. This allows us to feed more people. And, and in fact, in 1920, Scientific American ran an article saying well, they, they did an experiment where they pumped carbon dioxide into over um, crops and showed the tremendous increase in growth, which would occur. So the, part of the reason we've been able to feed all, all these huge growth of humans um, over the last um, few decades is because we have more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and, and food grows faster. I think I may have some slide. On. Okay, well, I might, I might get to that later. I, I apologize for the order of these slides, sort of random, um, but they're all interesting topics. Okay, so so another um, another point that's that that's extremely important uh, relating to the this whole idea of climate treaties and climate politics and climate <laughs> legislation is that these people are doing absolutely nothing. For decades, they've been make having these every year having these climate meetings and making climate agreements, but they've done nothing to slow the growth of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. They go to these meetings, make big speeches like Al Gore's hysterical rant yesterday, and say they're doing something. They keep saying they're doing something, but they're doing nothing. They're, they've had no impact on the growth of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere through dozens of these agreements. So well, that's, good, even, that's a good thing, Tony, that they haven't, because we want the carbon dioxide to go higher. It doesn't affect temperature. But yeah, it doesn't. We, we, yeah. But it's wonderful for humans and, and the environment. Yeah, that, that's true. But from a political point of view, it's just, it's all just hot air. They're not actually doing anything. They, they make, you, Joe Biden kept making this point that survival of the planet depended on him defeating Donald Trump. But carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere the highest, this graph shows their annual rate of growth of carbon dioxide. The actual highest levels occurred the last time Obama and Biden were in the White House in 2015 and 2016. And under President Trump, the rate of growth actually went down a little bit. But over the past 30 years, since they started holding these climate meetings, the annual rate of growth has more than doubled. So they're not doing anything. Uh, they pretend they're doing something. They they, they talk like the, the survival of the planet depends on them, but it's a complete scam. Whether even if you believe that carbon dioxide controls the climate, these people are not doing anything about it. And there's very good reason for that. It's because Western countries like the United States and and Western Europe and Australia and Canada, they don't we don't control the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That that's controlled by Asia. We have countries like China and India where they have a lot of poverty and their their main concern is improving the wealth of the country and lifting people out of poverty. They don't share these neurotic concerns about carbon dioxide, which we do in the West. And they're building coal-fired power plants as quickly as they can um, in order to provide the energy which their countries need. So we have the, all these people claim, or we have these arrogant Westerners who believe they control everything and the world rests on their shoulders. But there's, the United States could drop off the map. It would have no, very little impact on the growth of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because that's being controlled at this point by China and India and other Asian countries. Can so, we come back to that point in a little while? I'll let you keep going, but there's yeah. something I wanted to, uh, to share with people. Okay. Um, so this graph shows carbon dioxide um, growth in the atmosphere since 2014. So you see, it doesn't make any difference whether Barack Obama and Joe Biden are in the White House or if Donald Trump's in the White House or Biden's back in the White House. It grows at the same rate, regardless of, of who's in the White House. So th these claims that it makes a difference are just politics. They're just a way to, they're just scaring voters and trying to get people to be frightened and vote for Democrats, even though they're not actually doing anything. And, and it is interesting there that the, that the carbon dioxide is, is increasing in a cycle, an annual cycle. And that's to do uh, from my, what I've read to, to do with the Northern hemisphere um, having deciduous 
trees and so in in your spring and summertime there's an explosion in your in your um vegetation foliage and so there's carbon dioxide taken out of the atmosphere and also at the same time as your summertime uh it's our southern hemisphere winter time and our surface temperatures in our ocean um cool and we have got i think about 81 percent of the southern hemisphere is covered in ocean so we've got a massive a massive uh, coverage of ocean compared with the northern hemisphere so what happens with carbon dioxide as you know tony when the water cools it's it's carbon dioxide is more soluble and it's absorbed into the ocean so uh, you've got the oceans absorbing carbon dioxide in the southern hemisphere and the plants absorbing ca carbon dioxide in the upper upper atmosphere and so you get a decrease in, in carbon dioxide annually and then an increase and a decrease and an increase so and and Al Gore was talking about that in his in his movie, his science fiction movie, and he said, "Don't pay any attention to that. It doesn't really matter." You know. Yeah, and, and anyone who's opened up a warm beer knows that it, yeah. it, it fizzes over because the solubility of carbon dioxide in warm water is lower than in cold water, and that's one of the first yeah. things you learn studying geology in college. So the yeah, there's very and and that's the, also the reason why when you look through ice core records why the carbon dioxide levels and, and earth's temperature through glacial periods follow each other it's because when earth cools the oceans absorb carbon dioxide and then when earth warms again coming out of a glacial ice age then it, it re returns the carbon dioxide to the atmosphere so yeah. that and that was the whole premise of al gore's science fiction movie from 2006 was that graph which he completely misunderstood. He interpreted it that CO2 was driving the temperature when, in fact, the ice car record showed the exact opposite, that temperature drives CO2. Yep. And so he was putting the cart before the horse and he made hundreds of millions of dollars and got a Nobel Prize for that you know, ridiculous scientific error. Well, I, I think he, not only was he putting the cart before the horse, he was putting his wallet before truth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he certainly got. He, he's, a, he's a crook. He's a crook, Tony. That you know, there's not, there's not, no other word to describe Al Gore. The bastard owns fifty percent of Generation Investment Management, which, uh, uh, which was one of the the shareholders in Chicago Climate Exchange, yeah. where all, they're going to funnel all their carbon dioxide credits through. And who was a fellow director? Marie Strong, who started this this crap on global warming. The whole fabrication. Anyway, keep going. Yeah, I mean, the whole carbon market is based on the idea of non-delivery of an invisible product to nobody it's it's got to be the great it doesn't need yeah, it doesn't a, anyone's needs <laughs> it's the greatest scam in history so they're selling it's like selling dehydrated water it's pretty much the same. <laughs> uh let's see what we got okay so here here's another thing right so they keep we keep hearing about this tremendous progress of wind and solar well this shows the use of various energy types around the world um the use of coal oil and natural gas is skyrocketing around the world whereas wind and solar are making almost no progress um they're, i think they're up to maybe three or four percent now but the actual amount of growth of coal oil and natural gas is quite a bit larger than the tiny bit of growth which has occurred in in wind and solar but we, we keep hearing from these politicians oh we're going to be net zero by 20 no we're not it's going to it's going to continue growing and the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is going to continue going and all the bluster and hysteria and bad policy from these politicians is not going to make any difference well in in addition tony um what you didn't mention there and, and what's burning in, in my mind is that solar and wind have had that that slight um growth due to subsidies right and due to very favorable regulations, and in many countries like Australia, where the regulations uh, are, are making it very difficult to have a coal-fired power station, and the same in your country. So, not so. Despite incredible tilting of the field in favor of solar and wind, they're virtually nothing. Well, they're inherently unreliable. You can't run a country. You can't shut the country down because the wind's not blowing. So you, they have to keep enough power generation from coal and natural gas and nuclear power plants around. So when you build a new wind farm, you're not shutting anything down. You're just adding more cost to the grid because it doesn't replace anything. It's just an additional expense, it's additional maintenance expense, and just makes electricity more expensive, which is what we've been seeing. 
That's right. Uh, keep going. Okay, so so we keep hearing about we're having a climate emergency and a climate crisis, but if you look at the death rate from global death rate from natural disasters, including meteorological and climate events, whatever those are, it's actually down 95% over the past century. So there, there's no empirical evidence to support the idea that we're having a climate emergency. In fact, the data shows the, the exact opposite, that humans have never lived in a safer time than they do now as carbon dioxide levels have increased. So that's another aspect of the scam. Um, life and that that that, that uh, dramatic reduction in deaths is due largely to two things, in my view. One is the remarkable uh, efficiency of hydrocarbon fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas. They're miracle fuels. And and the second thing is the dramatic progress that we've had in material science due to the efficiency brought about by carbon uh, hydrocarbon fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas. Yeah, that's, that's definitely part of it. We also, during the 1920s and 1930s, there were terrible droughts and heat waves, which killed the large numbers of people. Um, 1921, there was a horrific drought, which covered uh, much of Europe, Russia, and Asia, which left millions of people on the brink of starvation. And then in the 1930s, we had there was terrible flooding in China. Flood in China in 1931 killed millions of people, and there were several other very bad floods in the 1930s, and there were very bad droughts during the 1930s as well. So there's also been an improvement in the climate over the last 100 years as well. So, yeah, but a lot of it is technology and, of course, the availability of fossil fuels, which allows people to have air conditioning, which keeps them from dying in the heat like they used to 100 years ago. And the cold. Yeah, in the cold. Um, okay, so here's another thing. Life expectancy has been steadily increasing over the last century. And the shape of the graph is almost identical to carbon dioxide. So, so once again, there's no indication that the growth of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has hurt humans. In fact, we see quite the opposite. Um, well, just on that, uh, your, yeah, country, uh, your country has, in its latest figures seen a reduction of life expectancy by two years in the United States. And that we believe that that's largely due to the injection deaths following the COVID vaccine. You know, that yeah. that's just been terrible. Yeah. Our next door neighbor um, had a, a blood clot in his brain a few weeks after he got his injection and they took him away in the ambulance. You never saw him again. He died a week later. Um, so that's certainly my experience. Um, crop yields have skyrocketed tripled around the world as carbon dioxide has increased in the atmosphere. This, this is also due partly to uh, better fertilizers and irrigation, but the amount of carbon dioxide, and we saw from the NASA slide that it's getting greener and so having more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere makes the crops grow faster, as Scientific American pointed out in 1920. Um, Malnutrition is way down over the last 30 years um, as carbon dioxide has increased. Um, poverty has plummeted over the last century. Wow. The literacy has plummeted. So where's the crisis? All the, all the key indicators show that things are getting better for humans. And it's just it's mindless hysteria about carbon dioxide, which isn't supported by any actual data. And they've got fake, their fake temperature graphs, but that's all they have um, to work with. Okay, so we've already looked at these ones and the adjustments. Okay, so yeah, this one, we didn't look at this one. This one um, plots the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere versus the adjustments they're making. So once again, you can see there's almost a precise fit. So basically, you have to describe this as the most, the worst science ever done, the most fraudulent science ever done, where they're precisely altering the data to match their theory about carbon dioxide. It doesn't get much worse than that. Um, if you look in, this is in the front page of the New York Times from 1989. U.S. data since 1895 show no warming trend in the United States, right? But if you look at the current NASA temperature graph for the United States, now they show lots of warming during that same time. So it's good to have the New York Times showing 
<laughs> the, the, here's this is from the National Climate Assessment for the United States. It's heat waves. It shows that heat waves were much worse in the United States during the night prior to 60 years ago than they have been over the last 60 years. So we constantly hear the and then if you look at the eastern half of the United States, the, their highest temperatures are much lower now than they were prior to 1960. So we keep hearing this fear mongering in the United States about heat waves. They're all going to die from heat waves. But the reality is that the United States' heat waves have gotten much less severe in the United States over the past 60 years than they were prior to that, when carbon dioxide levels were higher. So that's another major scam they've been pulling. Yeah, but Tony, uh, just on that, yeah. our, our, uh, my understanding is that the majority of the American states, I think something, something like 35 out of 50 of your states, the, the record temperatures for each of those states was set in the 30s and 40s. And, and, yeah, and yeah that, that's correct. Yeah, 1936 was an incredibly hot year. And you can see that spike on the graph here and about half of mm -hmm. the states. Um, North Dakota got up to 121 degrees Fahrenheit, which is absolutely phenomenal temperature. Um, and many other states got close to that. Wisconsin was 114 degrees Fahrenheit. They never get over 100 anymore in Wisconsin. So yeah, we, it was extremely hot back then. So once again, that's another example of government agencies and the press misinforming the public about heat waves. They keep saying heat waves are getting worse, when in fact they've gotten much less severe than they used to be. And and the other the other point it, I would it, would it, add it, the, it would add is is that. The hottest temperatures in Australia in their record were in the 1880s and 1890s. Not only were they hotter than today, but the heat waves were more often longer and hotter than than periodic heat waves today in Australia. But the other thing to, to note from that is that we had a re we had our hottest period around the 1880s, 1890s. America had them in the 1930s, 1940s. So there's no such thing as global climate. It's regional climate or in, even national climate is not appropriate because sometimes Australia overall can be warm, but a certain region may be going through a cold period. And same in the United States. Yeah, Australia had um, extremely hot weather on 1877, 1878, when New South Wales set their record at birth. Um, 1890, January 1896 was the hottest month on record in Southeast Australia in 1906. Was when Victoria set their all-time temperature record, and, and um, I think Western Australia also set their temperature record in 1906. But 1939 was also an extremely hot year in Australia, and I think that Melbourne and Adelaide, uh, Melbourne, yeah, Adelaide and Canberra all set their temperature records in 1939, and there were massive bushfires in 1939 as well which nearly extincted the population of koalas in Victoria. So um, generally night, the 1930s weren't extremely hot in, in Australia, but 1939 was a particularly bad year there as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, God, my throat's a little dry. Um, so this, this map is from NOAA, and it shows why the United States temperature record, which they've massively tampered with, is so important. It shows where NOAA has daily temperature data from 1891 to 1920. You see the vast majority of it is in the United States. Mm. There's also some from Western Europe and um, parts of Australia as well. But the vast majority of the Earth, they have no daily temperature data at all. So... When they tamper with the U.S. temperature data, they're actually tampering with the vast majority of, of high-quality data, which is available. So that, that makes what they're doing in the United States particularly um, offensive. But there's another point there, Tony. Um, yeah. Anthony uh, Watt, um, from What's Up With That, did a study, and as have other people, looking at the, um, the temperature recording instruments and they've been increasingly in larger cities and cities have grown they used to be on airports and on grassy airports out in the suburbs now they're in the center of the city and they're very much hotter because of the urban heat island effect so when you take out the urban heat island effect the the supposed warming just just disappears 
Yeah, that that's the you other. Know, it's not just big cities. It's, I mean, even in suburbs, I, I ride my bicycle everywhere. The difference in temperature on a, on a still night riding through a neighborhood and when you get in an open space, it's tremendous. And we, in, yeah. in neighborhoods, we have asphalt, we have people running their air conditioners, they're running their heaters, we have snow removal. All of the heat, when, when you're running the heat in your house, all of that, or your air conditioner, all of that heat escapes out into the environment and warms the temperature. So certainly big cities are a problem, but even small communities have the similar issues caused by um, localized effects, which have nothing to do with the global climate. Um, another no, thing no, about, we, yeah, go ahead. We, we've got records in this country, temperature records, that show the cities have warmed slightly, the major cities, but the six capital cities, but the country as a whole, and the particularly the rural areas, have cooled. Yeah, um, and it, it makes it makes sense. You know, with, mm -hmm. we, they're collecting temperatures in places where it's very suspect. And then the other problem, of course, is that most of the you know like Africa, South America, Antarctica, Greenland, much, much Siberia, they don't have any long-term temperature data, so they're just making it up. You know, they're they're literally just making it when they make these very detailed temperature maps. Most of the data they're using is fake because they don't actually have any real data. So that's another big part of the scam. Uh, so here's a really this one's one of my favorites. So in 1989, Tom Carl, who's head of National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's <laughs> climate analysis, said. He was a climate skeptic at that time. He said, while well, global climate warmed overall since 1881, it actually cooled from 1921 to 1979. And he said that most of the increase in global temperature happened before 1919, before the more recent sharp rise in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So this is another example of how they've altered the data. Now, um, um, NOAA shows the exact opposite. They show that Earth cooled prior to 1919 and they show that earth warm from 1921 when they used to show that it that it cooled so they once again we see another example of them massively altering the data the situation was in 1989 noah did not believe that global warming was having any impact but after they altered the data now they can generate all this propaganda which is not legitimate so, and in so, that case tony Who's re who changed the temperature records? Did Noah do that, or did NASA's got it in space studies? It was, it, it, was, it was Noah who did it, and it was probably yeah. Tom Carl who did it. Someone convinced him probably that it was better for his career to, to go along with global warming. <laughs> we saw this. We've seen this with a lot of people. It happened with Mark Ceres at the National Snow and Ice Data Center. He used to be a climate skeptic, and then he realized that. And Stephen Schneider is another example. He was yeah. a global cooling guy. And when he realized that the money was in something else, he flipped over to the global warming stuff. Yep. Okay, so here's not so here's NASA tampering with the global temperature record. This was what they showed from uh, eight from the eighteen seventies through the nineteen seventies and two thousand. They showed that there was no net warming, and that the warmest year during that period was eighteen seventy eight, which was around the time when when New South Wales set their, their temperature record at Burke. So this is what it looked like in 2000. Now I'm going to show you the same graph um, a few years later. So they they got rid of all of that. Nah, there was no warming trend. They erased the very hot years of the 1970s and created a warming trend, which doesn't actually exist. So this is what they did to the global temperature record. So Which, more, by more, the way, uh, yeah. Dr. Dr. John McLean in Australia was the climate scientist, was the first person to do an audit of the Global Historical Climate Network data. The only audit. It had never been done before. And he found startling uh, anomalies and, and, and wrongness in, in that data. So it's never been audited, this data, until he did that and he found it was a sham. Yeah. Excuse me, Malcolm. I've got to go take care of something for a minute. I'll be right back. <laughs> okay. Carbon dioxide is essential for all life on this planet. So what we've got is a trace atmospheric gas. And it's, it's a trace gas because there's bugger all of it. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere 
is around about 0.04%. So it's much less than 1%. In fact, it's only four one hundredths of 1%. And uh, it's essential for a life on this planet. It's natural, it's um, colorless, odorless, tasteless, non-toxic. Now, then some people say, well, arsenic can kill you with tiny quantities of arsenic and so can cyanide. Well, that's true, but that's from a, that's from a chemical effect. What the United Nations and the World Economic Forum are claiming is that carbon dioxide has a physical effect. A gas that is a trace gas cannot have a physical effect. When it's a trace gas, it's minuscule. That's, that's the first point. The second point, and we can have a conversation when Tony comes back, is that the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere are independent of carbon dioxide production by human beings. We've seen that uh, in 2009, after the global financial crisis, there was a, almost a depression. There was a severe recession around the world. Australia didn't suffer because we were, uh, man, we were exporting um, minerals, so we didn't suffer. But the rest of the world basically had a major recession. So in a recession... The consumption of hydrocarbon fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas decreases. And that means there's less carbon dioxide produced. It decreased too. What happened in, to the levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, though, as humans cut back on carbon dioxide output, the levels in the atmosphere continued to increase in 2009 after the global financial crisis. The same thing happened near depression, the significant downturn, the recession in the year 2020 when the COVID virus triggered governments into some insane measures, including insane restrictions. We had a recession around the world, the use of carbon dioxide, use of hydrocarbon fuels, coal, oil and natural gas decreased, the level of the, the amount of carbon dioxide produced. So what we've got is a complete reversal of the belief that carbon dioxide from human activity affects and determines the level in the atmosphere. The level in the atmosphere is independent of the production of carbon dioxide by human because a fundamental fact that the UN climate agency, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has admitted is that the oceans contain in dissolved form 50 to 70 times the carbon dioxide in the Earth's entire atmosphere. Slight changes in ocean temperature lead to release of carbon dioxide from the oceans and increases in the atmospheric content or decreases in the ocean temperature lead to reductions in the atmospheric content in the atmosphere. So we've got hu humans being completely independent of, um, sorry, having no, no impact on the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere, completely dominated by mother nature. Um, we also noticed that climate optimums, that's what the geologists call, geologists call the past periods in Earth's uh, history, geological history, when life flourished and human civilization flourished, they're known as climate optimums. And the climate optimums are, are the name given to periods of warm, warmer than today in, in, uh, in Earth's history. So climate optimums show that warming is not something to be afraid of, as the UN is doing. The, the climate optimums are significant things we should look forward to. As you can see from Tony's data, which is accurate, the temperature is decreasing. That should be a concern. Warming is not something to be afraid of. It's something to be embraced and welcomed. Pray for it. I mentioned we might get Tony to talk about it. We've only got about five minutes left with Tony. But the other thing I wanted to mention is that NASA is, is um, famous for being a scientific agency because people's lives are at stake. And uh, astronauts, when they go in, in, into space, their lives depend upon having good engineering based upon good science. It was, I think, in the early 2000s, uh, early 2010, sometime after 2010, 150 NASA executives... NASA managers, NASA scientists, NASA engineers, and astronauts wrote a letter to the head of NASA saying, for goodness sake, stop 
this fraud that's going on with the with the NASA's Goddard Institute of Space Studies making its absurd claims about climate. So that the real scientists in NASA, the real astronauts, they're recognizing that NASA's Goddard Institute of Space Studies has corrupted the climate science and is basically lying. Here's Tony back again. Ah, oh, you've got, yeah, got yeah, one of your is, puppies. This is one of our six month old puppies, Upala. She's, she's, oh, wow. she's a real sweetheart. Tony, we've only got uh, about four minutes left, actually okay. only three minutes. So um, is there anything you want to say about what's happening overall in, in the climate, climate um, con? Well, I, I think we've had sort of a big event with um, Elon Musk on Twitter. We're now able to get the message out. Um, I was banned from Twitter a year ago for posting a Pfizer document. But they've been trying to get rid of me for a long time because people didn't want to hear this climate stuff. So um, Elon Musk has been allowing climate scam to trend on Twitter. And a lot of your tweets have been near the top of that, actually, Senator. So congratulations for that. So Some of my tweets on climate are retweets of yours, mate. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, so we're able to get word out to a lot of people. Um, I think people who are starting to... <clears throat> understand that they've been scammed about the vaccines um, and they can't trust government are also being exposed to the climate stuff now. So hopefully we're going to be making progress um, with people moving forward. Thank you. Is there very quickly, I want two things. Um, would you like to have a word about Tim Ball? Because I think he's the best, oh, right. was the best. Any comments you'd like to make about that? Yeah. I mean, Tim Ball was an incredible person and, um, and on a sad note, I mean, his life, his health was largely destroyed by Michael Mann, the world's number one climate scamster. Michael Mann sued him, kept him in court for 10 years, drained all of his family's resources. And that, that had a big part. It was a huge amount of stress on him. And that had a big part in Tim's demise. So it, it, it's really horrible what happened to them. Um, the Ball family has suffered tremendous um financial distress as a result of this the millions of dollars in legal fees went into it and there's um they have sites up where people can support them to help with their legal fees so um we'd be really appreciate anyone there tim ball is a wonderful person like you said and anything that your your listeners can do to help would be greatly appreciated tony would you be willing to come back and and as because I, i've got a sense you've got a lot more to say Hey, I could do this for days on end. This year. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll, we'll get you back. Uh, and we'll talk about solutions as well. We, we will, we'll ask you why Toto features so much in your in your uh, social media. Very quickly, YouTube, Twitter. Where, how oh, do people yeah. find you? Oh, um, I think I had a slide up, but it's just um, my handle on Twitter is just Tony Climate. On YouTube, it's Tony Heller. And my website is realclimatescience.com. That's right. It's one of the first slides, I think. Yeah. And and I, I thoroughly recommend Tony's website and, and his and his tweets and his YouTube. But um, I want to thank you very much, Tony. We will have you back. But I want to thank you very much for uh, coming on the show today. Uh, and I want to particularly thank you so much for all the marvelous work you've done over decades, all voluntary at your own cost. Um, so... I want to say until our next show, Malcolm Roberts show, this is Senator Malcolm Roberts, staunchly pro-human, proud of who we are as humans, and a believer in the inherent goodness and care in human beings. Take a minute, please, to appreciate the abundance and potential in us and all around us. And please remember to listen to people, to love people, and to love one another. Until the next, next show. This is Senator Malcolm Roberts.